arguing for is that there should be some local flexibility, that each market is different, uh, and that Australia and New Zealand came through the crisis in better shape than just about any other economies in the world. The banking system was strong, it was well regulated, and therefore we probably don't need as strict a standard as that. But uh, I guess we're going to have to wait and see. Um, So I'm optimistic we'll actually get some local flexibility, but we do need to be mindful that there's a strong push in some markets for these sort of funding ratios to come in. When you say profound impacts on the cost of funds and the availability of funds, can you give us a sense of what that might mean for business borrowers or home mortgage borrowers or...? The, the regular people? Well, it's, it's difficult to determine because you'd have to you'd have to get a sense about just, you know, the, the full nature of the implementation and importantly the transition time. That's a critical part of it. I mean, that would have an impact. But, yeah, you'd be talking the fact that you might see significant increase in spreads. And when I say significant, I mean, I think anywhere you start to get north of 50 basis points, I think, you know, over and above normal funding costs, that starts to get significant. But you'd also see a potential constriction in capital or rather constriction in credit that you just wouldn't have that amount of credit available. If you start to get a situation where the marginal dollar of capital becomes very precious, then you may actually find that you know it's, it's deployed much more lightly than it is now. Uh, is it inevitable, though? Uh, we leveraged up on too much debt in the developed world. New Zealand and Australia have plenty of foreign debt. Surely this is the inevitable result of um, a deleveraging process and the regulators are just forcing us to do it. Oh, look, I think there's going to be... I'm not suggesting that there's no case for change. I think there is a case, and I think things like liquidity standards have been highlighted as being very important that banks can support themselves through, you know, short-term funding crisis. I guess what I'm arguing for is a recognition that these are not necessarily bank issues. They are economic issues. Australia and New Zealand are structurally reliant on those, you know, those uh, funding sources. Um, Therefore, there's got to be both, I guess, some recognition of that structural imbalance, but also some note that any change has to have transition with it. I mean, if you force the change through quickly, it'll have more significant impact. Now, New Zealand knows that Australia is its largest trading partner. We watch the Australian economy closely. National Australia Bank is uh, one of the biggest business bankers, so has a close finger on the pulse of what's happening in the Australian Mm. economy. What's your view of where it's headed? Yeah. Well, the Australian economy at the moment is, is definitely performing well on a relative basis. Unemployment's just come down again to 5.2%. But what we're seeing at the moment is just a little bit of uh, a drop-off in business confidence. And that drop-off in business confidence is leading to a fairly low demand for business credit. Now, interestingly, we've actually, from sort of the Christmas through to Easter period, actually had a very steady rise in business confidence. But it wasn't translating into business credit demand either. So I think people were sort of saying, I feel better about things, I feel better about Australia, I feel better about the world, but I'm just not quite sure I'm ready to go out and commit to that investment yet. And I think since Easter we've seen the Greek crisis. Um, Obviously there's been a fairly profound debate in Australia over the uh, mining tax and other things, and you're seeing confidence just drop off a little, and of course as confidence starts to drop off, you do get that demand for credit uh, lowering again. So we, we, we see the economy's being quite strong. I mean, at the end of the day, it really is driven by fairly substantial demand coming out of China, but we're just not seeing the demand for credit as strongly as we might hope. Uh, what's your view on how a potential mining tax might affect the Australian economy? New Zealand watches closely what's happening with the mining sector. What should we be keeping an eye on there? Well, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's a fairly fluid debate at the moment. I think there's sort of some indications that there might be some further consultation. Um, you know, the, the consultation really and the transition again are the, are the critical things. I think fundamentally um, you know, a range of people are indicating there is probably a model for some sort of you know, resource tax. It's existed in the petroleum industry, although it's a different industry with different economics for some 25 years. And of course we already have um, state royalties. So there are effectively mining taxes that exist now in Australia. So I think it's a question around how it's implemented. So I think it, you know, not necessarily that a some sort of resource rent, you know, proposition isn't going to, you know, can work and work effectively. I guess it's an issue about what it's how it's structured, and of course the transition and cons- consultation associated with it. Now the Australian banks are major players in the New Zealand scene. There's been murmurings for years on and off by some that um, one or other might pull out of New Zealand. Um, What's your view as the CEO of National Australia Bank on the long-term future for the Australian banks in New Zealand and of NAB? Well, I, I can't comment on the on the other banks' plans, but I can certainly say that National Australia Bank's got an unwavering commitment to BNZ. 
BNZ is a fantastic part of our global franchise. Uh, you know, it's a bank I feel personally close to, I and mean, obviously had the privilege of running it for a few years, and I st I'm still a member of the board here. But we've never contemplated, uh, in certainly in my time at the bank, that we'd do anything but support this business. I think it's a great franchise. I think we're very proud of the role it played during the crisis. We were the most active business lender. We think it's really important that we do support the business. Um, so we've got nothing but you know um, strong support for this business. Now, during the crisis, um, there was uh, quite a bit of money shuffled from Australia to New Zealand to back the banks mm. from the point of view of being the chief executive of NAB. Uh, what actually happened during that period in terms of um, parent parental bank support of the local unit here? Look, it was very significant. I mean, and uh, it was never a question. There was never any debate that we wouldn't do everything we could do to support the New Zealand bank here and support BNZ. You know, when we were in the dark days of those crises, I mean, clearly there was concern, there were constraints on BNZ and other New Zealand banks getting funding in their own name. I think that's where the real strength of the Australian ownership comes through. Now, there's always going to be debates, and I remember from my time here, there's fairly robust debates about what that means. I think you prove the value of the ownership structure in a crisis, and I think what happened in that crisis was the Australian, all of the Australian banks. Uh, stepped in very quickly and provided very extensive lines of support that kept the banking system here functioning. Um, there was never a question that we would do that um, and it was a very, very important uh, point of support. Now I think you saw in other markets uh, that didn't have perhaps that you know, larger parent to rely on, they got themselves into very significant trouble. The government either had to step in or other situations occurred. So I think the support that was provided was vital to you know, New Zealand, you know, Obviously, didn't keep New Zealand out of recession, but it certainly meant that the banks were open for business. And the scale of that support for, for New Zealanders? Well, been? it was in the order of $5 billion of liquidity was put in between sort of October and, uh, 2008 and December 2008. It was very substantial liquidity lines. But it's not just the physical cash. It was also the signal to, to offshore markets that we would stand there and we would stand in the market for as long as required to support the banks here. So, you know, that's a very powerful thing. Uh, markets rely on confidence and certainty, and what the Australian, all the Australian banks, did was step in very quickly and say to markets, "We will stand by, no matter what, our banks here in New Zealand." Cameron Klein, the chief executive of National Australia Bank, there talking in another of our double shot interviews here on interest.co.nz. I'm Bernard Hickey.